Uh, today, um, uh, Dr. Fetzen, Savi Fetzen, uh, a friend, colleague, and neighbor, um, is going to present a paper uh, not on the original title that we had listed, is multi-organ transplantation ethical, but rather on the title ethical considerations in simultaneous multi-organ transplantation. I, I, I do think we'll get close to the original question also. Um, Savi and I have been talking about this topic for a while, but today's paper is very much Savi's work. Savi, um, as you know, is the associate director of the um, adult uh, heart transplant program and is the director of the pediatric heart transplant program, um, is an expert in uh, the management and care for patients with uh, severe heart failure, um, has been much involved in the LVAD program, um, and Savi and I go back quite a ways. Um, uh, Savi's father followed me by one year in the chief residency here, and I I don't know if you were born quite yet. <laughs> it, was, it was very close, but uh, no, yeah. so so uh, we've known each other for for a long time, and it's a pleasure to to welcome Savi to to the seminar and to, to look forward to the seminar. Thank you. Thank you. It's a a pleasure to be here. I, Wednesdays are always a good day because it's filled with all the ethics conferences, and, and this year, of course, is certainly. So yes, this year has been a great year in conference. I was saying how much I like Wednesdays. And it's actually, uh, I'm glad that I came after uh, both Laney and Dick, although they're hard speakers, to follow just because of, I think, some of the questions I hope to raise. This, the, what I'm going to present today are more ideas that I think I want to use to spark conversations. So the presentation hopefully will be a little bit shorter to allow some more time for discussion because this is simultaneous multi-organ transplant is is talked about a lot, is is questioned a lot, but is actually not very common. Uh, so to get started, I just, um, just <laughs> my son likes airplanes. Okay, so I have uh, no relevant disclosures other than that, that I am a multi-organ transplant cardiologist. So the SMOT, as I am going to call it, the simultaneous multi-organ transplant. Just to let you know what I will not be talking about today when I refer to simultaneous multi-organ transplant, I'm not talking about retransplantation. I think that poses a different set of ethical questions. I'm not going to be talking about sequential transplants, which involve different donors. And I'm also not going to be talking about either on block renal or double lung transplantation. I'm going to consider those as being one organ transplant at the same time. So that's what I'm not going to talk about. I also want, for the sake of this, discussion today to have everyone realize that we work in a system that is full of inequities and they are just a given with the system with which we work and they are inherent inequities. Are we, there is geographical inequities depending on what region of the country you live in. There is not equity within a region because of our insurance. Um, if you are uninsured or insured that is good. If you are underinsured that is no good for transplantation. Referring practices have both sex and racial biases. So that is an inequity that is intrinsic in all of medical care, but certainly in transplantation. There is misinformation about the success of transplant. This cover from Life magazine is from 1973 about the tragic record of heart transplantation when most of the first transplant recipients died. And this is still a misconception in uh, certainly thoracic transplantation in a large part of the community that it just doesn't work. There are inequities in the listing criteria, and I think the last two weeks we've certainly talked about some of that, and I want to allude to some of that as we talk about people listed for multiple organs. And lastly, there is the inequity with who is able to receive a transplant. You could be an undocumented citizen and donate. You cannot receive in this country because of many reasons that have to do with our healthcare system. So this is our givens, and this is the system with which we are working. So when we talk about simultaneous multi-organ transplantation, there are many aspects that we could talk about from an ethical standpoint. I want to really focus on two. In part just because they, they were focused on the last two weeks, so I think it, it is in good continuity to the last two weeks, but I want to talk about the equity of allocation or justice, if, depending on which word you prefer to use, and the utility or effici efficiency of the receipt of that organ. So I'm going to focus primarily on those two to answer the fundamental question, is it just to use three organs for one person rather than to use one organ each for three people? That is the big question that often comes up with the discussion of simultaneous multi-organ transplant. Is it better to save one 
so to speak, or to save three. And in order to think of that, you have to think about what is the need for the organ? What is the acute need for the organ? The present need, what is the urgency? How great is that need for the organ? And what is the lifetime use or need for that organ? And then also, are all organs equal? There are life-saving organs, there are life-prolonging organs, and there are what I refer to as lifestyle organs. So depending on which organ you add, is it a life-saving or a lifestyle, life-preserving organ? Because I think these play in, these need to be considered when you're talking about allocation and need for the organs. So this is UNOS data, and it, it goes from 1988 in the top to 2012 on the bottom. In green is the total number of transplants done. In red, that little teeny sliver you could probably barely see at the back, is the percentage which are multi, simultaneous multi-organ transplants. I should probably say to begin with, the simultaneous multi-organ transplants are from deceased donors. So I'm just going to be talking about the allocation of deceased, um, deceased donor organs. But you could see starting back, the, this, the database just goes back to 1988. There were 38 simultaneous multi-organs done at that point, and last year, 567. So out of a total of 25,000 transplants, roughly. So a very small number of simultaneous multi-organ transplants. Looking at those centers over the last 24 years that have done over 100 simultaneous multi-organs of all varieties. So you put a thoracic organ with an abdominal, you put two abdominal organs, you put three abdominal organs. These are all any type of configuration of organ transplants. There are 24 centers that have done greater than 100 simultaneous multi-organ transplants over the last 24 years. The majority of these, about 58%, are going to be liver kidney. Um, they're actually broken down in such a way you, using the UNOS database that they actually don't differentiate KPs and they don't kidney pancreas and they don't differentiate heart lungs because the numbers are so small. So those, those are going to be excluded from these, these pictures. We are sitting here at number 13. Lucky or unlucky, however you want to look at it, but we're number 13 in this group. Um, these are just baseline, so 58% liver, kidney, for those of you who can't see. Um, liver intestines, 10%. Liver pancreas intestines are 16%. Heart, kidney, 8%. These are all simultaneous multi-organ transplants over the last 24 years in the U.S. out of UNOS database. And that is us, and this is our breakdown of what we have done here. And we have done, certainly, the majority are going to be liver, kidney. Um, we have done a fair number of heart, kidneys, and liver, hearts. And we probably have, we have the second greatest number um, next to Cedar sinai in uh, California, actually, of the liver hearts. We're very aggressive in that population. Now, looking at 2000, this is, again, reg uh, regional and national data. Looking at simultaneous multi-organ transplants from 2011, this is, again, UNOS database. And it represented only 2.6% of deceased donor allocation. So again, a very, very small number. But you could see just on this slide, I tried to color code to match so you could easily see which region matches with which. We're sitting here in region in the blue line, in region number seven. Our region's pretty good, as is number five and number two. But if you're in region number six, you're not really going to be listed or get a successful simultaneous multi-organ transplant. Again, these are inherent inequities of our system. If you live in this part of the world, you got to travel a long way to get a transplant. How do we compare with our European colleagues? Now, I only have data here from the Euro transplant, which is Central Europe, so that's going to be Germany, Austria, Hungary, Croatia, those Central European countries, and then the Scandia transplant. I unfortunately could not easily get some of the Spanish data, which would be interesting given how aggressive they are in their organ procurement. That's, their data are not transparent, and they're all in Spanish, and my ability to read Spanish is non-existent, so I was, it was very difficult for me to find this. But based on at least Euro transplant and Scandia transplant, these are from 2012 for Scandia, 2011 for Euro transplant, they actually do proportionally greater number of simultaneous multi-organs than we do. Um, and the breakdown, you could see about here, this is a KP, so certainly in this big line here in the Euro transplant is Germany. So they do a lot of um, kidney pancreas, for those of you who can't see, they do, they actually include the heart lung here, which the UNOS uh, doesn't include. They do a fair number of liver kidneys and then heart kidneys. The big two lines here are Austria and, and Germany are the two big transplant, transplant centers in Central Europe, although Croatia, Croatia is coming up there. Looking at the Scandia transplant, um, they do a significantly fewer number of transplants, certainly their population is less, but they still do 3.2% of their total number of, of deceased donor, and I've just put deceased donor numbers here are simultaneous organs. So they do proportionally more than Europe. 
uh, in Europe than we do here. So again, still a very small fraction of the number of, of allocated donors. So going to our two questions, is it just or is it fair to take one, one person and give them three, or should we take three people and give them each one? So this, this really, I think, ties nicely with what um, Dr. Thistlethwaite talked about last week and then Lainey the week before about the idea that if someone needs an organ, they should have the same chance as another person who needs an organ. There should be equity in the potential to be allocated an organ. Equal opportunity for scarce resource. So this should be independent of how many organs you need. If you need an organ, you are the same as someone else who needs an organ. If you, are, if you need two organs, you should still be the same as someone who needs one organ because you still have the need for an organ. Again, this is going to tie into how great is that need for the organ? Is it a life-saving versus life-preserving or uh, lifestyle organ? The way allocation works in this, in this system, I think, is, is important to at least reflect upon. Allocation scales are certainly different for each organ, and each allocation system has a different intent behind it, so to speak. So, for example, the MELD is to try and reduce mortality while waiting on the transplant list. The lung allocation system, which I know we're going to hear about next week, when Dr. Russo comes back to talk about it, perhaps a new proposal, the lung allocation system is designed to improve the recipient's survival. So for one organ, we're trying to improve survival on the list. For the other one, we're trying to s improve survival after the transplant. So these are two very different goals of our allocation system of organs. For the heart, it's in theory to reduce mortality on the waiting list. I put in theory because with VADS now, we have a different way to keep people alive while waiting. And that, that in itself is a, no, a whole other, I think, ethical quandary that we're going to have to address. But just to keep in mind that our allocation system is not the same. And the intent behind each organ is not the same. There are certainly morphologic and biologic constraints for whether or not people are acceptable for a given uh, donor. And the intent behind all of these is, of course, to reduce the waste. We know there's a donor shortage. We want to have whatever organs are out there to be used equitably and efficiently. So what is the UNOS policy on simultaneous multi-organ transplants? Um, what I've highlighted here is the fact that within region, patients who are simultaneously listed for multiple organs are, in fact, given a priority. So the highlight report says, the second required organ shall be allocated to the multiple organ candidate from the same donor if you're located within region. So if, you, if your number gets pulled for whatever organ you need, the second one will get allocated to you within reason. The policy goes on to say, however, if you are outside, if the organ is coming from outside the local organ distribution of the OPO, voluntary sharing is suggested to give you the second organ. So basically, we're asking for altruistic donation from one OPO to another OPO of, a door, of the second organ. So within region, you get priority for both. Out of region, we're asking for altruistic donor from one institution to another institution, with then the, the policy being that you should then pay back that, that organ. So if I get a kidney from New England, for example, to go along with my liver or my heart, then I should, my next kidney that comes up should go back to New England. We know what altruistic donation is and how successful that can be with, among individuals, let alone on, um, among institutions. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Now, when we talk about recipients, I just, when we think about recipients, how do we choose a recipient? Because I think how we choose a recipient, again, depends on the organ and depends along all the not only medical considerations, but should everyone be a transplant candidate? How old is too old for a solitary transplant? How old is too old for a simultaneous multi-organ transplant? Cancer, whether or not you choose to transplant someone with a non-melanoma to skin cancer depends on what organ you have. It's a moving target. Other options, I think, need to be considered. End-stage management, which essentially in some ways comes down to lifestyle. Mechanical circulatory support for heart transplantation. When is this a good option or a better option? I don't think we have achieved equipoise with mechanical circulatory support and transplant, but at one point, is it a reasonable good option? At what point is continued hemodialysis a reasonable option as opposed to a kidney transplantation? Because there may be some situations which it is actually reasonable. It is a lifestyle choice because life prolongation for a 70-year-old may not be that great with the transplant versus dialysis. 
Recipient selection is also important beyond the medical situation. So psychosocial considerations are valued very differently depending on the organ that a patient is being evaluated for. And in the US, thoracic centers use a much more stringent criteria based on psychosocial factors than do abdominal organs. So 5.6% of patients evaluated, these are old data, they haven't really been updated much better uh, in the last 20 years, but 5.6% of candidates were excluded for psychosocial reasons for thoracic organs for being recipients compared with 2.8 and 3.6 in renal programs. We're certainly better and more stringent about this than we are than they are in Europe, and I think that actually has to do with national health care because insurance is part of the exclusion on a psychosocial level for transplantation, and in a national in a nationalized healthcare system, you don't have to at least cover this. But I think that when you're talking about simultaneous multi-organ transplantation, someone might be considered a transplant candidate for, let's say, a kidney, but might not meet this, the transplant criteria at the same institution for a thoracic organ because of some of these other issues. So the allocation practice for multi-organ transplantation in the US, the simultaneous multi-organ recipient is given preference for the single organ candidate with the highest urgency as long as that other person does not exceed them on the list. An organ can be allocated to the SMOT recipient and can pull the other organs, the secondary organs with it. So the advantages are a heart or, or liver recipient can listed for a simultaneous kidney transplant can, for example, be listed, be waiting for 30 days and receive a kidney where someone just listed for a solitary renal transplant in this state may wait four or five years for a cadaveric donor. That is certainly, that is an advantage to the simultaneous multi-organ transplant, absolutely. And more importantly, a simultaneous recipient might only be a candidate for a simultaneous organ and not for a solitary organ. There are many institutions that would not consider cardiac transplantation in someone with a creatinine clearance of 40, but would consider a multi-organ transplant with a, someone with a creatinine clearance of 40, so a heart kidney as opposed to a solitary heart. So the, f the fact that we can offer simultaneous organ transplant might make someone a candidate where otherwise they would not be. So there are certainly some advantages. Now there are disadvantages for being listed for a multi-organ transplant. It's hard to find multiple organs in the same donor, depending on how the donor died, whether or not there's any trauma to either the abdominal or the thoracic organs, size constraints, quality of the organs, multiple procurement teams fighting for vascular access or vascular conduits. It's, it can be challenging to find the same. And it limits you to within region because you're, again, counting on the altruistic donation of the second organ out of region. So there are both advantages and disadvantages to being listed for a simultaneous multi-organ transplant based on the allocation system in the US. Just, just a, a point of clarification, because there might be some confusion. So the, the, the regulation is within the OPO. And you're, right. and, Sorry. And, we're, you know, and OPOs are then grouped into regions. Regions. And so it really limits within OPO. Right. Sorry. Everyone heard that in the back? It limits within OPO rather than within regions. OK. So that's sort of justice and allocation and equity to being a potential candidate. How about how we use the graphs, the efficiency, utility of the graft? So there are a couple of things to consider. There's the medical utility to the recipient, right, which is both patient survival and graft survival. They are both important because if the graft fails, then you might need retransplantation. So depending on what that graft is, which organ it is, you might need retransplantation or not. So the survival, of course, is changing over time. And unfortunately, a lot of the data that are out there regarding simultaneous multi-organ transplant are, are broad database analyses that cover a huge span of time at which there were different immunosuppressions. So survival, survival has improved over time for all of these. But the survival graphs for multi-organs is a little bit confounded because the numbers are so small and they're looking at 20-year cohorts as opposed to 10- or 5-year cohorts with more modern-day immunosuppressive techniques. There's also the idea of social utility. Now, social utility is generally not considered in allocation practices in the US with the exception of pediatrics. So most people have said that we are not going to use social utility as far as you know, how worthy is this person to receive one or two or three organs. Um, so with the exception of pediatric transplants, this is not part of utility. So it's really the medical utility to the recipient. So is there an increased utility by using simultaneous multi-organ. And this is actually data that Piotr was actually part of um, when he was at his previous institution published in, in 2008 about this was a UNOS um, 
database analysis looking at graph survival from donors from the same donor. And what we have here, just it's hard to read, but these are heart transplant rejection free liver transplant and kidney transplant looking at different combinations of heart alone, which is the lowest line versus heart, liver, heart, kidney. You have liver alone, which is here. Liver, kidney is, does better than liver alone. And then you have simultaneous kidney heart. You have kidney alone, which is the middle, and then kidney after liver, which is the sequential transplant I was talking about. But certainly this, these data suggest that simultaneous transplantation confers improved survival in patients as long as the graft comes from the same donor. So simultaneous, not a sequential um, multi-organ transplant. Again, these were published in 2006, looking at this is simultaneous liver kidney transplantation versus kidney after liver transplantation. And what I've highlighted in the um, red dots or the red squares is the combined liver kidney or the simultaneous liver kidney was their terminology. Um, and again, this is again looking at 1996 to 2003, so it's again a very broad period of time. Certainly early on you might have a little bit, this is patient survival, a little bit of early operative mortality, but as you extend out, you have patient survival improve with simultaneous transplant. Again, this is graft survival. Long term you have improved survival. And then this is death sensor graft survival. So if you take out the early operative mortality, you have improved outcomes as far as graft survival and Rejection-free graft survival if you have a simultaneous multi-organ transplant from the same donor. Now, these are outcomes after the institution of MELT, which of course changed some of the liver donation um, allocation processes. This was published in 2008, and these are simultaneous liver kidney versus just liver transplant on patients who had been on dialysis. This is looking at people with renal dysfunction. So these are patients who had been on dialysis less than three months. And three months comes up as, a, as an interesting period of time because you're worried about the people who either have chronic kidney disease or those who have hepatic renal syndrome. And trying to differentiate between whether or not you should give a kidney to someone who has hepatorenal where you anticipate that renal recovery will happen versus those who are truly intrinsic renal disease and you anticipate the chronic sequela of calcineurin inhibitors and renal dysfunction. So in this one, it's, uh, the colors are hard to show, but the liver transplant alone does better in people who are on dialysis for le less than three months. These are people looking at people who are on dialysis longer than three months. And in this case, the liver transplant does worse. So in people who are on renal replacement therapy for greater than three months, if you take that to mean chronic renal disease, not a hepatorenal syndrome, they do better with simultaneous allocation of a kidney and, and liver from the same from the same donor. And then this again looks at uh, overall survival. You have a kidney transplant alone up here. You have solitary or simultaneous liver kidney with a meld of less than or equal to 23 and then those with a meld greater than 23, looking at the, the survival curves. So certainly data to suggest that in the modern era, simultaneous liver kidney transplantation with people with intrinsic renal disease is protective for the patients, right? Be beneficial use and is efficacious for the patients. The question, of course, is whether or not hepatorenal syndrome, what that does, and whether or not we should look at the hepatorenal syndrome and those people with acute renal failure differently. This was published just at the end of last year, um, looking again, and this, this is one study that actually suggests a different outcome, and, and there were many, actually Dr. Abacasis wrote an editorial about this, um, article that came out uh, questioning their data because their data are very different from all the other subsequent data and did not exclude the people who had a powder renal syndrome because this is sort of a wash as opposed to whether or not it's beneficial or not. So certainly more data are needed because of this question about how we actually look at people who are in need of a kidney versus just a liver alone. And how do we use it? So these are, this was a survey done of those centers that did, or that, that performed simultaneous multi-organ transplants looking at specifically the heart kidney, I'm sorry, liver kidney, which again is 58% of those multi-organs in this country. Sorry about the, the way it projects. Um, and it's regional. These are what people use to allocate a kidney or not, or to see. And you could see here you have a 24-hour urine. These are always, sometimes, rarely, never. So there are some centers that always use a 24-hour urine for creatinine clearance, and there are some centers that never use a 24-hour measured creatinine clearance for the allocation of 
a kidney in the setting of, uh, of liver dysfunction. There are some people who use whether or not you have renal replacement therapy, whether or not they automatically put it on patients who are waiting for a kidney, or whether or not they do a kidney biopsy. There are some places who 2% never does and 4%, sorry, 2% always do, 4% never, and sort of sometimes or rarely. So clearly there's no uniform standard practice in the U.S. among centers to say, does this patient need a kidney in addition to their liver? So the current guidelines for simultaneous liver are those people requiring dialysis, so chronic kidney disease requiring dialysis, those who have uh, GFR less than 30 mils per minute by MDRD or proteinuria of greater than 3 grams in a 24-hour period, sustained acute kidney injury requiring hemodialysis for six weeks, um, sustained acute kidney injury with GFR less than 25 mils per minute for six weeks not requiring hemodialysis, sustained chronic kidney injury or metabolic disease. However, there was a summit at the end of last year which specifically looked at this, which looked at whether or not we should adjust our criteria for simultaneous liver or kidney. And their recommendations were that they should use a stage 3 kidney disease, creatinine greater than 4, or an acute increase, or the need for renal replacement therapy, or an estimated GFR, typically MDRD, of less than 35. They actually have included kidney biopsy. So a kidney biopsy with greater than 30% glomerular sclerosis or fibrosis as a marker for the need for chronic kidney disease or the anticipation of truly kidney disease as opposed to hepatorenal, or two grams, so a slightly lesser amount of protein. And making it into sort of a nice schematic of how, how one might take this to look at it, I modified this from a paper that actually came out in 2011, it really depends on the amount of dialysis. So this is acute renal failure and liver disease. Depending on whether or not you are on dialysis for less than six weeks, you go straight to a liver transplant. If you're on it for greater than 12 weeks, then you go to simultaneous liver or kidney. If it's been in that intermediate period, you have some type of operative assessment, which might include a renal biopsy. And depending on the result of the renal biopsy, you'd either give them a kidney or you'd go straight to solitary liver. This is chronic kidney disease. Again, they would say if you have a creatinine clearance of less than 30, you go to simultaneous. If it's greater than 60, liver. If it's that intermediate period, you do a biopsy again. So more concrete data to say, yes, these kidneys are not the hepatorenal. They probably do need simultaneous multi-organ replacement. And this is looking at chronic kidney disease with cirrhosis. So these are liver. This is heart. And this, they need you to get a portal wedge pressure. So if you have portal hypertension, you get simultaneous liver kidney. So you get a simultaneous liver with your kidney. If you don't, then you have to measure the hepatic wedge. And if your hepatic wedge is high, you get a simultaneous liver with your kidney. If not, you just get a kidney transplant. So this is what has been proposed. I haven't seen this been ha having been acted upon. And this was actually published before the, the summit that was at the end of last year. So this is sort of data on how effective simultaneous liver, kidney, for example, are and the use of the graft in patient survival. Now, how about for hearts? So we should, I'm, I'm a cardiologist. I think the heart's an important organ. I think it's a, a life-sustaining organ as opposed to a lifestyle organ um, at this point. And one of the, what are the benefits for doing simultaneous hearts with thoracic, uh, heart with abdominal organs? And one of the, the big benefits for, I think, cardiac transplant recipients is to prevent graft vasculopathy, which is a, a, one of the most common causes of graft loss after certainly one and certainly three years of um, transplantation. And these are just pictures of what graft vasculopathy can look like. Um, and so if you do a heart plus one, so a heart plus a liver, a heart plus a kidney, for the most part, again, I'm not talking about heart lungs because the data are so few, um, but a heart plus one transplantation, this, again, was looking at a very broad period of time, so 1992 to 2009. Again, old immunosuppressive strategies as well as modern ones, looking at consecutive heart transplants and then uh, simultaneous heart kidney transplants. This was published just uh, a few years ago. And while you certainly, what this shows is you have essentially equity in survival. So certainly this was in the face of such, um, suggestions that there was an increased mortality and decreased survival if you did simultaneous heart with abdominal or heart with kidney transplantation. And in this group of pa uh, patients, you did have 13 of the transplants. So 13 of the patients who just got hearts were on dialysis. 
which was interesting. They just got hearts, but they were on dialysis. And 18 of the 30 who got si simultaneous multi-organ transplants were on dialysis. However, 12 were not. 12 were just had stage 4 renal disease. And their survival is essentially, this is patient survival, and this is survival from any rejection, with a trend towards perhaps the kidney being protected from a re rejection standpoint. However, is it protective against uh, coronary graft vasculopathy, which was at CAV is? And this is looking at a uh, total, again, old period, 1995 to 2003, so 22 solitary hearts and then 13 simultaneous heart kidneys. So again, small numbers. But what you have here in the blue line is patient survival. The numbers are so small, so you don't actually have statistical significance, but certainly um, survival is here. You have freedom from acute cellular rejection in the heart transplant. This is heart kidney, so heart kidney certainly does better. Again, not quite significant, but better from acute cellular rejection. And then we think of uh, graft vasculopathy as sort of a marker for antibody-mediated rejection. And there is a significant protective effect of getting a kidney for the development of graft vasculopathy in these patients. So if you look at the people who developed, there was 32% of the heart alone transplant patients who received, who developed graft vasculopathy, four of them ultimately required retransplantation because of their graft vasculopathy. So kidneys were protective in these patients for the development of graft vasculopathy. This is again data saying that it actually caused less rejection in both grafts. So not only did you have less acute cellular rejection of the heart, you had less cellular rejection of the kidney. So if you did a simultaneous transplant of a heart kidney, you had better outcomes in both grafts. So this was the time to cardiac rejection and time to renal rejection in, again, small numbers and a very broad time period. I keep bringing it up because the data are so few because we're doing hundreds of these as opposed to thousands every year. This is the only slide I'm going to say, show you about pediatric data. Um, this was just, again, UNOS database looking at pediatric thoracic uh, use of multi-organs, either heart plus another or th lungs plus another. And these are heart only, so if you had a heart, lung, liver, a heart, kidney, or a heart, liver, they did better than the, the heart alone in the pediatric population. These are the lung only, which is matched by the heart lung. But if you put a lung with an abdominal organ, they had better survival in the pediatric population as well. Now, Mark Russo, who is again coming to talk next week, when he was at Columbia, worked with some people looking at uh, the UNOS database, looking at whether or not we could predict risk for getting a simultaneous heart kidney transplant and survival risk. And what they included, I'll, I'll read it out just because people in the back may not see this, but what they included in their risk model was peripheral vascular disease, recipient age over 65, non-ischemic etiology, a bridge to transplant with an assist device, and dialysis dependence at the time of transplant. These are each given a weight. What they excluded was diabetes, previous transplant, um, African American race or ethnicity, donor age greater than 40, and morbid obesity, BMI greater than 35. And they divided it into low, moderate, and high risk, four, four to six, and seven. Just to give you an idea, peripheral vascular disease gives you a four. So if you have peripheral vascular disease, that immediately puts you in moderate risk according to their risk model. Being an older recipient gives you a score of three and a half. So if you're over 65 with vascular disease, you're automatically in the high risk category, just to give you an idea. And they looked at only 274 patients for the UNOS registry for 10 years who received simultaneous heart kidney. So again, very, very small numbers. And what they found was that depending in, in the people who had a creatinine clearance less than 33, it, the patient survival stratified out by this risk model. So that if you had a high risk, your patient survival at one year was only 61%. We would expect national averages now to be anywhere between 88 and 92%. So certainly that would fix with the low risk, which is 93%. Moderate risk, again, this is a historic period, so you have to take that into account, is 74%. But certainly this was significant depending on your risk model. What was interesting was that in those patients who had a creatinine clearance greater than 33, so you'd assume these are people who had chronic kidney disease were not on dialysis, it didn't, the risk stratification didn't work as far as numbers. Now, there were only 60 patients, so there may not have been a statistical significance just because the numbers were so small. But certainly this is the only study that's really out there that might suggest how we might choose to allocate or choose to list someone for simultaneous organs 
with a risk model. Now, we, this is data that we presented now nine years ago, it's hard to believe, um, at the um, AST, looking at some of our, the first sort of cohort of our simultaneous heart with other organs here. And this is really, um, we, this was 16 so, um, simultaneous heart kidneys, three heart liver kidneys, three heart KPs, and 10 heart kidneys. So these are our data. And we had a mean follow-up at that point of 51 months. Six of these patients were on dialysis at the time of transplant. And patient survival here is in the blue, was for simultaneous, certainly was better than those who had solitary kidney, I mean solitary heart. So adding an additional organ at the time of transplantation in our institution here conferred a patient survival benefit. Two patients did lose their renal graft. So two patients ultimately ended up on dialysis after their sequential or their simultaneous transplant. So to go back to the question, should we give two or three organs to one person instead of to two or three? Equity is, as Dick pointed out last week, is, is legally mandated. So the, the ability to be listed for an organ or the, the access to an organ is, is mandated. So we have to have equal access to an organ. So the question is, if I, have, if I need two and you need one, do I have as much right to be listed as you do? Yes, I have as much right to be listed as you do. It is a very small proportion of deceased donor allocation in this country. Less than 3% of deceased donors. This is the, the population we're talking about. So I think in that respect, I think we, we, it is appropriate to list people for simultaneous multi-organ. Optimal use. We want to have the resources used to the greatest benefit possible. So both patient and graft survival are certainly at least as good, if not better, if you do a simultaneous multi-organ transplantation. Whether or not it's patient survival, graft survival, freedom from complications, if you do a simultaneous transplant, you have better outcomes. So the efficiency is certainly there. So if we want to do it in an efficiency model as opposed to an equity model, even in that respect, I think it's more efficient. However, age does appear to be a risk. So I would say that age has risk for poorer outcomes, and many centers, including ours, have lower age criteria for simultaneous multi-organs than they do for listing for solitary organs. And I think that is also an ethically justifiable position to take based on outcomes and based on the fact that often the second organs are lifestyle organs as opposed to life-sustaining life organs. So I hope this, is, uh, this is, will spark some conversation and some debates and perhaps some dissension. I'm sort of, I was torn about how I felt about this. I mean, I practice it, but I, I still am conflicted in myself depending on what side of the bed I wake up on about how I feel about this. So hopefully this will spark some debates. And I certainly want to acknowledge I, I had to put everyone here, and I was started typing out all the names, and there were just too many. So just all of the transplant attendings, the surgeons, the procurement coordinators, the VAD coordinators, I mean, everyone on this list, certainly, who helps take care of these patients. And multi-organ transplantation is a huge um, production. The stuff that goes behind scenes and the people involved. So everyone has been involved here. We have a very successful program because everyone on this slide, who I have not named because there are too many, work together. So thank you. I'll start off the questioning. Um, I think there's a couple of uh, additional issues that we need to, to get out. One is, um, I, you've, I think you've made a compelling uh, argument for uh, ethically uh, justifying the multi-organ transplant for a particular patient. Um, the, the, the side that you didn't really address, of course, is the, the policy issue. And that is, is that every time, let's, let's just limit it to, let's say, heart liver. Every time you do that heart liver, right, there's presumably some liver patient who doesn't get the organ who may, at least at some level of frequency, die. And <clears throat> that's where the, the real issue is. That, so we can, I'll, I'll say that one. And then the other issue is the pre-transplant mortality of that particular patient who is listed for um, a heart plus, right? Um, and versus if they were just listed for a heart, let, let's, let's, for this one, let's go with heart kidney, okay? okay? Um, so you've got a, a patient who is listed for a heart kidney, but in reality could just get a heart. And because of donor 
issues that donor pool is smaller and the pre-transplant mortality for that particular patient. So address those issues. Okay, so the first, I'm gonna deal with the heart kidney first. So certainly getting a simultaneous heart kidney increases your wait time, absolutely. When we have a patient who's been in house waiting now, I think for six weeks um, as a 1A for our heart kidney. Um, and it limits them to to the, to the region. It limits them because of cross match. Um, that being said, depending on how sick they are, again, it's an individual choice. Depending on how sick they are, we might choose to say, fine, we're just going to give you a heart and you end up on dialysis and we try and either do a sequential transplant later or dialysis is a lifestyle. Or a living donor. Living donor. But it's, it's di dialysis is, a, you know, kidney transplants are life prolonging, but I don't think they're life sustaining. So it's, it's one of those, I consider that to be in my category of lifestyle mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. organs. So you try and, if someone were acutely sick, you would say, fine, let's do the life-saving organ, bag the lifestyle, which is how we do it. We, we plan to do two organs. We go down to the OR, we, they get the life-saving one. If they can't get the second one because of instability, we stop. Um, so yes, I think it has to be evaluated once they're listed. And often, yes, you know, we list people, and depending on their creatinine clearance that week, we don't give them the kidney. Uh, we choose not to, to transplant the kidney. I think it's tough um, on an individual basis, but that's what medicine is. You'll have someone listed, and the day an organ becomes available, they may not be suitable or not. I mean, that happens with single organ listing. Um, so I think it, it does, that's one of the disadvantages of being listed. Now, and, that, and that you haven't taken into into your account in regards to your survival. Correct. Right? So you've got, a pre, you've got presumably an increased pre-transplant mortality. For those patients, for those and patients. the numbers are just too, too small, to look. Too, too yeah. small to figure out. But that, I mean, so the waiting time is absolutely greater. Right, absolutely and, and greater. And so, in the, in the theory, the pre-transplant mortality is also greater. For right, those patients. but then the post, but then you would hope that the post-transplant benefit would counter it, right. which is what you're, right. which is what you're, you're left right. with. Right. So we got to, I mean, it would be nice, to, and we, of course, we cannot have the data, right. but it would be nice to say, okay, from the time of listing versus, you know, right. of single versus multi. What and it's, and we're trying to look at at least some of our numbers here. It's just, it's hard and it's hard to get that information from UNOS. You know. Now, the question with the liver is tough because you have places where people are getting transplanted with a MELDA-14. And should we be transplanting people with a MELDA-14? Or should we use that liver for someone who is in a different region who needs it? So I think when you're, I mean, you're dealing, when you're talking about the liver and a heart liver, you're talking about two life-sustaining organs. Mm -hmm. And I, I understand it's, it's difficult, and it's always difficult when it's your patient who is either the one who's getting the organs or your patient's the one who's not getting the organ um, to try and, and, and figure out what's the best thing to do. And as, as policymakers, that's certainly one thing. As, a, as an individual doctor, our patient in front of us is the one we have to care for. Um, so again, it's whatever organ is highest within region that would drive. So if I have someone who's a 1A but has a meld of 12 and you have a liver patient who has a meld of 40, we're in the same region, the liver is going to get allocated to you. So my patient may miss out. And that's, that's sort of what our allocation with all of its inequities is stuck with. Right. And we, uh, you know, as, as you and I know, but perhaps the whole audience does, we've always gone to the side of taking care of our patient and right. doing both the transplant. I'm going to uh, follow a little on uh, Mike's uh, uh, question there. Um, it seems to me that in some ways what you were calling utility is really efficiency for the individual um, um, and saying, yes, yeah, it's more efficient for that individual mm -hmm. in terms of their best interests to get you know, the, uh, the simultaneous organs. Um, but it doesn't um, you know, ad address the question of social utility. And I know you, you can finesse you know, who's at you know, one end of the spectrum versus another. But just back of the envelope calculations, even if you discount the one kidney that's going to somebody who's on dialysis by 50% and say that that's uh, you know, a lifestyle uh, versus life-saving um, uh, in, you know, intervention, and you can even argue about that because it'll probably extend their life to get a transplant versus dialysis. Um, and the person you know, lives for 10 years you know, from all of these things. I mean, you're looking at something like 20 utiles you know, uh, versus eight utiles, just sort of on the back of the envelope calculation. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard from a social perspective to sort of say, you know, saving these three lives versus the other doesn't, you know, from a utilitarian point of view, but if you look count. At so, well, 
just wait. So that's okay. that's just the sort of you know sort of back of the envelope, broad sort of look at the at the utility. What may be the solution, right, um, is whether you're looking at um, access, equity of access to individual organs versus equity of access to life-saving organ transplantation, right? And everything is based on the number of organs and what we could do with them. And if you do that, then it seems to me that utility is so clear in terms of giving them to three different people that you can't make the argument that way. Um, but, and you'd have to make an argument that it's something like, uh, this person who is in front of me needs access, uh, equivalent access to life-saving organ transplantation. And that's the way in which I'd build a justice argument for this. So the, the, to bring up your point, and I, I agree that if you look at, you know, it would be nice to have two people survive as longer, longer, but if you look at actually the function of the graft, a kidney graft is better with a simultaneous other organ. So if you're looking at the use of that graft, that graft is going to do better if it's transplanted with another person than a nut. So I mean, if you, you could sensitivity analysis and the you know you could do that, but it's but but the but the but the data points out that if you're looking at the efficiency of a graft use, I mean, if you want to talk about the efficiency of graft use, then you'd never transplant a teenager, as that was brought up beforehand, right? Because they're just not going to take care of their organs, and we aren't we aren't prepared to do that in this country. Just sort of say if you're a teenager, sorry, <laughs> you've got five years where you just, you're the black hole and we're just not going to, we're not going to take care of you. Um, but it's, it's, we have never, I don't think this country is prepared to look at social utility um, in that respect, certainly in transplantation. I don't think we're prepared to look at it in any of our health care. I don't think we're prepared to look at social utility when people come in and they choose to take their cocaine instead of their clopidogrel because they both begin with C. Um, I don't think we are prepared to make <laughs> statements in our country about that. Um, until we get to a point where we are prepared to actually make people be accountable for their health care to that degree, it's going to be difficult to have any idea of social utility. And then you, you end up with the whole idea of you are born into a certain situation. If you are born into a certain situation, you, how, how do you ever overcome that if, you, if your social worth is deemed by what? How many? How many millions of dollars you're going to make? How many companies you're going to direct? How many kids you grow up with a nice, good, secure home? I mean, what what is social utility? I mean, what, one of the biggest, you know, the two biggest, I guess, multi-organ transplants that have got received press was that was the the boy who got 12 in all. Um, he got four three times sequentially because they they failed, um, or the governor, I guess, of Pennsylvania who got a heart liver. liver. You know, yeah, right. So, do you take him as being he was social worth, or do you take, you know, Mickey Mantle? I mean, there's what what is social utility? And to a kid who's going to lose their mother, that's pretty useful, or their father. So, so I have a, a comment and a question. The comment is, you could look at it, you could look at it as we're not ready to look at social utility, or you could look at it as we've decided not to look at social utility, and you know, all men are created equal. You know, dis regardless of their yeah. social utility, um, you know, people with more need get more Medicare dollars than people with less need, um, according to their their need. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm okay with not looking at social utility. I think our culture, or our society, is okay with that, and maybe prefers that. My my question is, it was I, I love the way you you, you um, called. OPOs sharing organs, kind of altruistic donation between OPOs. Except it's not really a donation, it's a loan because you're. You you're get paid back. You're supposed to get paid back. So why doesn't it happen more if you get paid back and it's not just a one time donation? I, 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 will, I will defer to Mike on that. <laughs> so, um, actually, actually, Unos has tried to eliminate all the payback. Uh, issues and I'm surprised still that, uh, uh, and Yolanda, you can. I mean, right? The kidney payback is is going away or gone? Three in the hole. Yeah, they, they, right. The whole the whole Maryland thing, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> no, no.
three. And all, but all the other, all the other organ, extra renal things, uh, the payback has pretty much been eliminated, right? Right, Ed? There is no payback. Right, there is no payback for any other uh, extra renal uh, scenario. Um, so, but, but that's really not the, the issue of why they don't do it. It's, it's, it's not altruistic in the way that we like to think of it in terms of altruistic kidney donation, right? Where you have a kidney and you altruistically want to give it to someone else. Um, when it's an OPO in transplant centers and they have an organ, um, they, their responsibility is for their patient and for their transplant centers um, to utilize those organs. And they always have a recipient. And so it it's, would be very difficult there for them to justify, let's say, let's say um, it was a heart liver that, that they were going to do, right, or that, that we had a patient, and the heart in um, Indiana, they got, they got, the heart team got a call, we've got a, we've got a heart that your patient comes up for. And our response is, okay, great, we will take it, and, you know, our patient needs a liver as well, okay? And so um, <clears throat> we're going to ask you to give us your liver, and let's say that they do. And then the Indianapolis Register or whatever the, the newspaper is comes to find out that during the time period, even if there was a payback, a liver patient in Indiana died, then they have a big problem because they gave away a liver to Chicago and one of their patients died. That's why the initiation of the whole, we're going to give you an organ and yeah, we'll get one back, really doesn't work very well. The, the kidney patients left over. Um, and there are great geographic disparities amongst um, recipients as well as OPOs. Um, there, there are, this is a very small percentage overall, but our region and our particular OPO has certain issues. For instance, in the last Gift of Hope report of the standard criteria donor kidneys, there was only one standard criteria donor kidney available for a kidney recipient. Everything else was either donation after cardiac death or circulatory death or extended criteria donor kidneys. So one could argue that the kidney patients are now receiving kidneys that are less likely to function long term and have poor patient and graft survival. And it's difficult for me looking at my patient, although I'm fully supportive of the multi-organs because it, you know, it's a great program and that's not it. But I, I do have concerns about the kidney patients that are left over that are arguably getting the worst quality kidneys because the best donors are the ones where we can do multiple organs. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, <laughs> yes. Um, I can, but I Yeah, no, I'm, <laughs> maybe afterwards. No, it's, uh, that, I mean, that's really the challenge. The challenge is whether or not we look at a patient in front of us who, it depends on how you how you look at a kidney transplant. I I mean I tend to I'm sort of above the diaphragm. I th I mean it's a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle or it is a life prolonging organ, it, but it is a lifestyle organ. It is not a life saving organ. No, exactly. But it's and a lot for, of patients get high on the list. No, they don't. They actually get no priority. Oh no! Well, I mean, in our you 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 uh, petition the other centers right. to get them high on the list. From one person always votes no. So you have to have a unanimous vote. So one person always votes no for those patients who've lost their dialysis access. Okay. So with the exception of those rare patients who lose complete dialysis <laughs> access, it is a life. So that's a part of my part of my sort of ambivalence about this is because I think, for the most part, when I'm talking about simultaneous organ, I really mean sort of kidney in addition to a life-saving life organ. And in which case, I think it is a lifestyle on both ends. You could argue that you could have a heart transplant patient who goes to dialysis three times a week, or someone who goes to dialysis three times a week who is in need of a kidney transplant. I mean, so in either event, someone's going to continue to go to dialysis. The question is, the person who gets the heart and gets the kidney is going to do better in the long term than if they didn't. And that's really what, for me, I mean, for me, first of all, they're, I mean, they're my patients, so from a, from a individual doctor patient, I want my patient to do better, but from a, from a standpoint of policy, they're still going to do better. So it is a better use of 
the organ because the organ is going to do better. I think that cutting down age requirements so that you, you do not do multi-organ transplants in people who are older, whatever that older is, you know, 60, 65, I think is reasonable because I think that the, if you could give that good organ to a younger renal transplant patient, solitary renal, they're going to get better benefit out of it. It's, it's a risk benefit. As, and as VADs get better, um, the arguments between Savi and Yolanda might come closer Absolutely. together. Uh, because Absolutely. Because essentially there's going to be the same issue of a lifestyle of having a pump. <laughs> I agree. Uh, I absolutely agree. Versus going agree. to dialysis three times a day. It's going to be very, very close. I agree. Um, but adding to Dr. Becker's question, you know, we seem to get a lot of consults where let's say you have a patient because you're bringing up a heart kidney who is requiring dialysis versus a kidney who requires dialysis. But what about the heart kidney whose GFR is 30, 35, not on dialysis? We know they're going to get on dialysis. No, but I'm talking about at some point in the future they're going to be on dialysis because there are certainly people listed for kidneys who are not on dialysis, right? There are people but, who are listed for kidneys be, without being on right. dialysis. But so you, we know eventually, we know this from, I mean, multiple, all organs, calcineurin inhibitors eventually lead to right. progression of renal disease. So they may not come out of the hospital on dialysis. They may be on dialysis a year later, two years later. Absolutely. The, I mean, I agree with what you're saying in that sense, but when you're calling it a lifestyle organ, mm -hmm. so if you have a patient who's not on dialysis yet, and needs a heart and you're wondering should we also give them the kidney knowing that they have CKD knowing that probably eventually they'll require mm -hmm. it but then you have a patient who is listed for or is listed for a kidney is already on dialysis and you know there's a mortality benefit to giving them a kidney it's really hard to justify double listing I don't think so because I think if you look at just the efficiency of the graft there it's going to do better so it depends on for the individual, for the yeah. individual yes but, but, but from the society's standpoint no you really can't call it addition, utilization of the program. Well, we can, well, it depends. So you can in this setting depending on insurance because your dialysis is covered, your, your immunosuppressives are covered for three years, and then you can't get immunosuppressives so you could lose your graft and go back on dialysis. Um, I mean, most of our patients are hypertensive and diabetic. Absolutely. So uh, you know as well, as well as I do that you know, patients who are on dialysis or diabetic have much higher mortality rate. So calling, you know, uh, kidney transplant or... Uh, it's like prolonging. Transplant. It's like prolonging for those patients, right. absolutely. Right. But, but calling it lifestyle... I would... I'm not really... I would, say, I, would, I would say like prolonging, but I don't think it's life-saving. I don't think it's life-saving, the way a heart transplant is life-saving. It is like prolonging, but it's not life-saving. So, Savi, with, with, your, with your introduction of this term lifestyle, okay, it's clearly causing friction. But I, I, I meant to be controversial. No, I'm okay. I, I know, I, I think it's actually great. But I, I think for me, you know, what, what is becoming evident in this series of, of talks that we're having around transplantation is to me, I'm wondering whether the ethical questions that, that are rooted in your talk and your presentation today aren't just sort of the tip of the iceberg for broader questions about really social utility decisions that are being made at a, at a policy and at a national level, but are not being made in, a, in any kind of systematic way. Because one could start, take the reasoning that you've presented and, and the, the, the counter arguments that are presented here and, and rationally go back down this line of argument that says, are we spending too much on transplantation overall at the expense of other life-saving endeavors, right? People are questioning your multi-organ transplants for the precise reason that their patients need those organs, right? And one could take a step back from that in a wider healthcare system perspective and say, are we just spending too much on these very advanced, very expensive, very worthwhile techniques in one respect, but what are we, what are we short shrifting in other areas of I, the system? I absolutely right? agree, which is why I think for, for patients in whom there are other management strategies for end-stage disease, those should be given weight, uh, great consideration to. I don't think VADs are at an equipoise with transplant necessarily, but I think for some people a VAD is the appropriate thing to do and not to transplant them. I absolutely think that we have to make decisions about how much money we're going to spend on these things, um, whether or not it's transplant, whether or not it's VAD. Absolutely. I think we spend far too much money on this end of the spectrum and not nearly enough on prevention. Absolutely. But 
prevention isn't sexy. Prevention doesn't get newspaper articles written about it. Unfortunately, I mean, again, society demands certain things. Um, whether or not we need to concede to their demands is, is different, and I absolutely agree. Savvy. I'm going to get out of this lifestyle versus <laughs> life saving by, by keeping, keeping to hearts and livers. We're in agreement, life saving. Correct. Uh, but, but, I, but I do want to press you just a little bit on the social utility because you gave a, a laudable defense of, of individual utility and of the doctor's uh, responsibility to advocate uh, in a vigorous way for his or her own patient um, in order to benefit the patient. And I, I think that's all correct. But, but from a social utility point of view, if you took something as simple as qualities, quality adjusted life years, and as, I don't know if anybody's done the study, and, and simply ask, uh, on these life saving. <laughs> What? 20, it's right here, 20 versus 8. Yeah, it's the, it's back of the envelope. Oh, Dan, it's the Dan back just, of the envelope yeah, thing. I'm sorry. So Dan, Take Dan, the envelope away Dan from just that map. Finished it, yes. But I, I mean, something as simple as that, and, and showing, yes, indeed, that for the individual patient, uh, a, a multi organ transplant, uh, the individual does better, but, but if you divided those organs between two people, you, you might, I don't know what, d double or, or triple the, the number of quality adjusted life years. And, and, and in the system where, where shortage is, is the, the unfortunate given, um, how do you reconcile th th those tensions? I don't, I don't think we have data. I mean, that's part of the problem. The numbers are too few that I don't, I don't think we could get those data to either support or counter the argument that the, gra that the quality and survival, rejection-free survival of the grafts in one person are better than the failure of the graft in two. I, don't th I think our numbers are too small, and the data that we collect on a, sort of on a national basis are just too sparse. We could certainly, I mean, we could try, and we have a fair number of patients here we could look at and see, but the, you know, qualities are, are, qualities are tough. Yeah, I mean, I, th I, th I think that, that that is the issue, and I mean, we could maybe w work on a model to try to, to demonstrate that. Um, I'm afraid, even though I'm an extraordinarily strong advocate of, of multi-organ simultaneous transplants, that it would not show the uh, quality of life benefit that we would hope for, um, except for the individual who actually got the three organs. I think the other way of pulling back from this specific issue is to say that we spend, spend too much on sick patients. <laughs> you know, not just on expensive procedures, but on sick patients. They, they soak up too much resources. And there's an alternative to that, and, which is called quotas. So it's, it's not a data issue. It's a political issue. Right. So I, well, you want to respond? I mean, you said called quotas? Yeah, quotas. Well, I mean, there's a quota in that we have a limited resource with transplant. We make decisions all the yeah. time about allocate, I mean, whether or not someone is a transplant candidate or not. I mean, so within transplant, we do that all the time now. We ration our resources. People hate the R word. We do it in transplant all the time. So, yeah, well, absolutely. But so, I mean, I think that we, you know, this is an, a, a fine argument and fine discussion to have. Um, we know that every dollar we spend on a, especially on a kidney transplant, because that's the easiest one to, to justify and talk about, we save over a period of time multiples of that versus them on dialysis. So it, we can say that we spend too much money on transplant. Let's, we can go down to kidney because we have that data. Um, but it saves the healthcare system a whole lot of money. Um, so it's, it's kind of nearsighted to say we're going to decrease the amount of money we spend on transplant uh, because we spend too much and not recognize that, in fact, that would increase the cost of health care overall um, if you did that in, just as an exclusion. Now, if you said we're going to decrease the, the amount of money we spend on transplant and we're going to have make sure that we have an effective preventative program, then that would be fine, but it has to work. And you have to be awake reading the article in the newspaper about prevention. Which no one there's ever there's is. only been one really good cost-effective analysis of heart transplants that, that I know of that was done in, in the UK years ago, and it was actually cost-saving. 
yeah. to do a heart transplant. Yeah. So but that's in a situation where you could go back to work as opposed to risking losing your disability coverage, which then gives, enables you to get your immunosuppression, which is why many of our patients, although they're functional class one, cannot go back to work. Yeah. And, and, and in most, there have been, there have been studies so, in, in all the organs that show that it's, it is life. Uh, it's I mean, cost it is saving. cost saving. But kidneys is, is the easiest one because we have the control of dialysis. So I, we're, we're uh, a bit after our one o'clock hour, and, and uh, thank you very much, and Sadi, uh, thank you.